All right, good morning, guys. Welcome to a workplace in a hostile world. This is an interesting topic, uh, very near and dear to my heart, uh, which is weird to say, but it really is. I think it's very important. And if you don't know, that was my mom who was taking pictures of that. So she was <laughs> up here. Uh, so I'm going to be mentioning some concepts that alone can take an entire session just to introduce. So like yeah, any one of them, we could probably take an hour and a half and just go really deep into it. Let me just pause. I can either see your faces or the letters. So I'm going to go for the letters. <laughs> so if, you, if you have a question and I don't know your name, it's probably because I can't see you. Okay. So any one of these topics can take up an entire session. And so we can't get into it, we can't really dive into it and start talking about the theory of this and that and what have you know, we don't we just don't have the time. Right? So we've we've only been given about 30 minutes to speak and then 10 minutes of QA. So what what we really want to talk about is uh, Christian responses to these topics and when they're brought up to us, right? And we're gonna do it according to scripture. So a biblical worldview, not a personal worldview, okay? It's biblical. Now, I should say that your worldview should come from a biblical perspective, right? So that's the first thing I, I do want to I do want to mention you. This is where I'm coming from, so you may not agree with what I have to say. That's awesome. I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. Uh, but that's that's how we're gonna have, that's how we're gonna handle it. So how has the workplace become hostile? So we have young people in here, we've got older people in here, and so some people have seen the swings. In, in your opinion, how has the workplace become hostile, or more hostile to believers? So this is the part where you guys chime in. DEI pronouns. DEI pronouns, that's great. Yeah, DEI pronouns. We're going to talk about that, so just in case you don't know, we'll bring it up in a few seconds. Yeah? Sharing your faith. Sharing your faith, yeah, that's huge. Right? Something simple as having a, a little sign on your desk, a little verse, and they ask you to take it down, but the other posters are not taken down. Oh, wow. That's huge. I'm not addressing that, so. <laughs> Sorry. That's good. What else? What else? What about, like, critical race theory? You guys ever hear this? Yeah? That's a big one. Uh, cultural Marxism. Have you heard that catchphrase? Grand Seism. Yes. Say it again? Grand Seism. Grand Seism. Grand Seism. I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's, All right. harder, it's harder than Marxism. Okay. Okay. And then we've got, so there's like this notion of feminism. Don't attack me. I have daughters <laughs> and a wife. I'm into women who are powerful. I love it. Right? I taught my daughters, hey, you're going to go to school first, and then you're going to seek out a husband. I, I'm into that. So... We're talking about militant feminism, right? We're talking about that kind of feminism where I don't need a man, which is anti-scriptural, right? Which, in essence, is anti-Christ, right? Uh, intersectionality. Have you guys heard that catchphrase? That's a really cool one. I like that one. Do you guys know what it, Does anybody know what it is? You guys know what intersectionality is? Yeah? So what intersectionality is, I'm going to use me as the example, okay? So... I start out life a little bit less than, let's say, a, 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 a Caucasian, a white guy. I'm a little bit less. Why? Because I'm a Latino man, if you didn't know. <laughs> so, right? Like, you guys laugh, but we're going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> so, so here's, a, here's a white guy. Let's call him WG. Oh, no. Oh, and I'm a little bit down from him because I'm a Latino man. And I was raised in the inner city. So, oh, I come down a little bit more, because now I was raised in the inner city. And my mom raised four boys alone without uh, my dad in the home. So now, now I'm worse off. Man, you got no shot. You got no shot. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You're all the way down here. Now, this is not Ricardo. If I were gay, I'd be over here. <laughs> now I really got no shot, because I'm a gay guy who was brought up in, the pro in, a, in a fatherless home, in the projects, and I'm Latino. Oh, you're done. Nothing you can do. That's intersectionality. Ricardo intersects in all of these oppressed groups. That's what intersectionality is. 
social justice, redistribution of commodities, wealth, land, or opportunities. We're going to touch on that a little bit, right? Forced use of pronouns. Some of you said that. Group identity. And, I'm sorry? Group identity. Group identity. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, antagonism towards Christianity entirely. Actually, what she said about you got something on your desk and you got to take it down. Um, what about the term my truth? I love that one. <laughs> your truth. It's, it's your lived. <laughs> They try to sound so educated. My lived experience, then I feel such and such a way. I get this a lot. Uh, I hear this a lot about my lived experience. So now, what are some common cultural lies that are related to work? This is a little bit more obscure question, but let me give you one. Work is only about personal fulfillment and advancement, right? That's, Oh, oh, I gotta, I gotta feel fulfilled in work, and 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 I have to advance where I'm at. And if I'm not advancing, something is wrong with those people, right? Something's happening with them, right? Uh, or it's you only focus on work. That's the other side of it, right? So as believers, you're just focusing on work. You're just focusing on advancing in work, making sure your career is set. There's, there's that kind of lie. You must give yourself first and primarily to work. Over family and church. Cultural lie. Identity is found largely or exclusively in what you do for work. Common question around men is like, hey, what do you do for a living? It's like, hey, my name is Ricardo. Hey, my name is Charlie. Hey, Ricardo, what do you do for a living? It's like, right away. Like that. That's, so I, because I, you can ask me anytime, I'm sorry. But I don't like that question. I try not to ask that question when I'm speaking with somebody, I want to know about them. But that's, it's just, a, it's just a personal thing, right? And work is bad. It's a necessary evil, so I'm just gonna do it. That's another uh, culture related to work. So now, let's define work. The word uh, vocation comes from the Latin word voco or vocare, meaning a call, your call. Your work is your call, whatever you're doing. How many of you believe that what you do is your call in life. How many believe that? I want to see a show of hands. Not mom, baby? You don't believe that? I, I was going to say she's going to be the first one. I don't know. Theirs is pretty stressful. It is, right? <laughs> I love it when people tell me, oh my God, those nurses get paid. And I'm like, they're not giving the money away. Amen. <laughs> These women and men are working really hard for this money. So I, I, I hear you. I hear you. My, my, daughter, my daughter became a nurse right when COVID began. She graduated nursing school, then she got into an ICU, and then COVID started. It's crazy, like, I would wait for her, she'd get home, she'd work seven to seven, I'd be sitting there like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and then she'd come there and unload everybody who died that day in ICU. That was like her decompression for like an hour and a half. And I felt like it was my call to sit there because she was gonna go crazy if she didn't unleash this to somebody. So yeah, work, Work is, uh, the kind of work you do um, really can be a call, it really can be a ministry, an opportunity for you to share uh, Christ. So how many of you are working in the field that you wanted to as a child? Like when you were a kid, right? When you were a kid, you said, I want to be, for me, I want to consult people on how to protect their property, <laughs> sell them as much electronic gear as I can. <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> Anybody working in the field that they did? Yeah? Well, that's awesome. That's great. Nursing? That's what you wanted? Awesome? I'm retired now, but I do. Okay. Awesome. That's fantastic. That's great. If you can do that, uh, that's great. I was in a meeting once, and the captain of the police department, they were like, how many of you guys are doing exactly what you are? And he went, I am. I wanted to be a cop since I was two. I, I believe it. He was, a, he was a cop's cop. His last name was Cop. <laughs> no, no, his last name Keith Cop. He was the, the chief of the department. <laughs> so, work is ordained by God. We see this in scripture, okay? We're going to touch on that a little bit, right? God got his hands dirty. He formed man from the dirt. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Genesis 2-7. 
Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils. This is like word pictures, right? The breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Right? It's, that's phenomenal. It's mind-blowing. Like right there. It's like, I, need, I, I got everything I need. God breathed life into the man's nostrils. And he created me in his image. I could end the lesson right there. And we walk away and say, that's it. We're in the image of God. We live like that. Too. We see that God's plan was not yet ready without man, as there was no one to complete the work God intended. Genesis 2.5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Not angels to work the ground, not the beings. He created man. It was his intention that a man, human being, would come here and work the ground that he created. God's plan the entire time was for man to work. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man... He put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. We are reminded in New Testament that God means for us to be working. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Action, works, we're supposed to be doing stuff for the Lord. Which includes your vocational work. It's a good thing to work. So we're going to tackle really quick the misconceptions with work. <clears throat> work is only about personal fulfillment and advancement. This is a lie. It's not about personal fulfillment and advancement. We see it in the New Testament, and it goes further in 1 Timothy. Get ready, okay? I'm going to knock some of you guys down. It's scripture. It's not Ricardo. Don't go out here complaining. <laughs> Ricardo was rude. <laughs> but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's hot. Holy smokes. <laughs> Just regular smokes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lazy, oh, and I got... I got pages and pages for the lazy, but we're not going to get into that today, right? You must give yourself first and primarily your work over family, church. Identity is found largely or exclusively in what you do for work. Work is bad. It's a necessary evil. These are all summed up in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. Time for everything. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. What do I mean by that? The point of the passage is that we need to use wisdom when dividing up our time, okay? Some of the most successful men on Wall Street are M&A investment bankers. Um, back when I was on Wall Street, they were called the masters of the universe. In fact, I saw an article preparing for this back in 2008 that they're still calling them the masters of the universe. So these guys make millions just on a salary. They make millions and tens of millions on their bonuses. Uh, almost all of them have what are called Wall Street widows. So these are wives who are incredibly wealthy, but they're raising their children as single mothers with nannies who are doing the real raising of the kids. Many end up in divorce. This story can be repeated for almost all highly paid positions. The question is, what are you willing to trade for that? These guys trade everything. They, they don't know their kids. They don't know their wives. Um, preparing for this and, and being on Wall Street back then, I see. I saw it firsthand, but then I was I was reading in the articles, and there was one blog, and it was Wall Street widows, and basically they were saying, oh, just if you if you're married to an investment banker, you're never going to see him. He's not going to know your kids. But so what? You have a lot of money. I remember um, back in the days, uh, you know, in the heyday of the big, big, big banks, these guys. You know, this was eighty. No, not not that eighty. Ninety ninety three. A, a, a ring, an engagement ring, was 100 grand. Say in 93, an engagement ring that somebody would wear. But these guys gave up their lives. Their lives. They went to work. Limos were waiting downstairs. They got in the limo, they drove to work. And that same limo brought them home midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And they did the next thing, the next day, 5 a.m., they had to be back in the office. This is absolutely true. And so you must be careful not to alienate your spouses with work. 
So for me, I'm going to give you a personal example. I love what I do. And, and I, say, I say to my wife, I know she was in here, but I don't see her right this second. Oh, there she is. I say to my wife, I don't work that much. And my wife's like, are you a nut? <laughs> you always work. And I'm like, no, I don't. Like, sometimes I just hang out at home. And she goes, yeah, and all you do is work. I love what I do. Right? I, I, like, I wake up in the morning excited to wake up. Okay, it's 5. I, I should get to the office about 6.37. Let me start the day. Right? I love what I do. It's, it's, it's just it's who I am, right? But I have a terrible internal clock. Because I think I'm not working, but I'm sitting with my uh, laptop on my lap, literally. And I'm doing work, and I'm answering calls, and I'm answering text messages, and I'm answering emails. But I'm next to my wife, so I say, hey, I'm present. <laughs> I'm here, babe. What more can you ask for? That's a problem, yeah. right? That's a, that, that's a real problem. So I'm going to have to go faster. I'm so sorry. So follow, uh, let me tell you more lies. Follow your heart. Oh, this is amazing. Jeremiah 17. Say so Jeremiah 17, 9, Jeremiah 17. 82. Yep. I've, uh, so, so the heart is deceptive. Let me give you an example. I've always wanted to own my own business, so I'm going to quit my full-time job and pursue my dream of entrepreneurship. <laughs> so Jesus addresses this, right? Luke 14, 28. For which of you desiring to build the tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Excellent book called The E-Myth. I was going to go more into it. I'm not going to. You think you, if you think you've been called to be an entrepreneur and you're going to leave that job that gives you health insurance and pays your taxes and gives you days off, read the e-book before you do that. Um, do what you love. It's another one. This is great. Now, I just said I love my job, right? But I also told you that when I was a kid, I didn't say, hey, this is what I want to do for a living. It's what I ended up doing, right? Love is a feeling and feelings change. What you feel today for something may not be what you feel in a few years from now. So you got to be careful about that, right? So here's the question. If work is ordained by God, as we've already established and the scripture is established, then what is our response as believers to employers who ask us to compromise our beliefs? Right? Hey, this is New Testament. Hey, boss, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me how to act. You can't tell me... Right, like you, you can't make me say him, her, she, it, whatever you, are, they, them, whatever you, are. you can't make me do that. Well, let's talk about this first. First, we need to deal with our character. Who are we at work, and how do others perceive us? So let me give you an example. Anybody in here, you say, hey, I want to lift weights, and I want to get huge. You're not coming to Ricardo for advice on how to do that. <laughs> right? You're going to Luke. Right? Luke's standing next to me. I'm standing next to him. You want to get huge? You walk up. Hey, Ricardo, how do I get huge? I'm going to look at Luke and be like, I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> right? Well, it's the same thing with work. How should we be carrying ourselves if we're going to stand for Christ? Okay, so Ephesians 5, uh, 6, 5 through 8. Bond servants. Ricardo, I'm not a slave. We're going to get to that. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service, don't pretend, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will, as to the Lord, my boss, as to the Lord, I'm reading scripture, and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or whether he is free. Ricardo, you didn't address the fact that I'm not a slave. Right, do you have a mortgage? Do you pay rent? Do you have a car payment? Do you pay taxes? Do you have to eat? Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. If you have a mortgage, rent, car payment, student loans, taxes, you owe something to someone. Now here I'm going to pitch Jenna and Scott's class, Financial Peace University. They will teach you the biblical concepts of you're not having freedom if you owe all this money to everybody else. And they will, teach, they will teach you the biblical concepts of freedom with finances and the way you're able to serve the Lord when you're truly financially free. So, are we doing best in our jobs constantly? Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. The entire chapter is written on how we need to carry ourselves as believers. 
if this is the case, then doesn't it stand to reason that Christians should always excel in their work and like cream always rise to the top? So all the top positions, all the highest money makers should be believers, right? Well, we're doing it for the Lord. Well, are you? It's a question you got to ask yourself. Okay? Uh, I remember when I first started my business back in 1998, when it would get slow, I would, I would drive a limo, right? And so here I own my business. It's wintertime in New Jersey. Construction slows down in the wintertime. It's not like Florida. So uh, I would supplement income. Right? I'm that guy who decided to leave that very cushy, high-paying job to pursue entrepreneurship. Talk with me later if that's what you want to do. Uh, so I drive a limo, and I, I used to say, I'm not getting anybody's bags. I don't pick up your bags, pick up your own bags. I'm not getting out of the car to open the door for anybody. I don't care who they are. I'm going to sit there with the sign, and they'll come. And this was me, like, I, I'd sit and I'd grumble as I drove, I ain't nobody certain. And one day the Holy Spirit just, he impressed upon me so hard. Okay, I told my wife, I said, I am their servant. I am going to pick up their bag. So then I'm going to endeavor to grab everybody's bag, make sure I meet them, walk them to the car, open the door, sit in there, have water, have mints. And then all of a sudden I became a very successful limo driver. <laughs> it's like the limo guy, the guy who owned the company said, hey, you want to buy this company from me? Everybody loves you. I'm like, nah, I got my own thing. But it was when I endeavored to truly serve others as a driver. This was a lesson God was teaching me. Trust me, guys. There was something in my heart that, that had to take place. Are we above reproach with respect to our time cards? Sick time. Are we lying in front of the kids? I'm going to call out sick so we go to Disney. <laughs> It's true, right? Ephesians 4.28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone. Mm -hmm. Now, as an employer who manages people, this is big for me. I'm very, I'm very, I work with my brother. Me and my brother run a company together. And he's like, you're too laid back. And I'm like, dude, this is the second time they're calling out. I'm like, so? They said they're sick. Like, I'm very, very easy about that. So when I do catch them in a lie, now I got problems. Because now I'm like, okay, like you, you violated my trust. And I take it very hard. So uh, that's one of my faults. Are you forwarding the racy joke? Are you laughing at the water cooler? The small racist joke? The, 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 sexual, in, the sexual innuendo joke? You find that funny? Ephesians 5, 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So my company, we have about, I think we're up to like 78 employees now. And when I fly back to New Jersey and we hold our annual meeting where everybody's in the room, my business partner stands up and he says, there is to be no cursing and no crude joking when Ricardo is here. He doesn't have to say that. I've never required that. But he feels, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I just needed to use examples. He feels, hey, when Ricardo is here, you're not going to talk that way. And this is the holiday party where everybody's drinking. But he's like, watch your mouths. And there have been times where we're in a group and people start joking crudely and he walks over and he goes, oh, oh, oh. Ricardo's at this table. Just relax. That's how we have to set ourselves up so that people know, right? Uh, you gossiping. Let no corrupt, Ephesians 4, 29, let no cor uh, corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but such is only good for building up, that fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Are we living in peace with our co-workers, even the ones we don't particularly care for? Romans 12, 18, apostles, so far it depends on you, live peaceably with all. If you have assimilated so excellently in your place of work that I cannot tell you apart from others, I can't even tell you're a Christian, are you really living for Christ? You need to ask yourself that. That's not a question that deserves an answer here. But say, hey, how do I look in the office? Like, do I look like everybody else? Do they not even know I'm a Christian? The point here is we need to be truly living for Christ. The only way is to be in prayer and scripture. So now we have a good framework of what a Christian or a believer looks like in the, per in the, in the workplace. Let's talk about the hostile world. DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let me read you something. For just as the body is one, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 
12 through 13. For just as the body is one, has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free, and we are all made to drink of the spirit. Now, this passage is completely out of place for this talk, right? It's yes and no. This has to do with the church and what the church looks like. So we will never entertain DEI in church. Ever. It has no place here. Don't I, I love it. I get I get all the time. Oh, oh you, there's a lot of Latinos now teaching in seminary. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Are they teaching scripture? That's all I care about. Yeah, Are they bad. teaching the truth? That's all I care about. Right? Dudes, excuse me. This is what I tell the guys, dudes, not you. <laughs> this church was in Lancaster, PA. Not many Latinos there. Mm -hmm. The population around that school or around that Bible school is like 98% white. You think there are going to be Latino teachers and Latino students? No. Is it happening now? Yes. Now we see it happening. Why? Because that's what happens, right? In life. So we're never going to deal with DEI here in church, and I'm never going to have that conversation. We're gonna, I'm going to shut you down. If you start talking to me about how we need to be more diverse or how we need to attract. We need to attract sinners. Right. We need to baptize human beings. Amen. We need to point them to Christ. Not Latinos or blacks or... or it doesn't matter the race. You can put in any race you want. So, creation tells us that God created man in his image. We all come from Adam. Right? So then this DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, there's no one better than other. We need to really believe this. The fall ushered sin into the world. That created division. So, this sounds familiar. Creation, the fall. Okay. And then the gospel ushers in redemption through Jesus. There is an exclusivity of the gospel and it is only through faith in Christ and through grace that we receive salvation. That's it. That's it. It is exclusive, and you need to understand this. There are not many ways to Christ. There's one. I mean, heaven, excuse me. There's one. One way, and we need to believe this. So creation, the fall, the gospel, that's like our four realities, right? We need to look at our workplace in, in, in light of the realities. Uh, do we consider others our brothers? Now look, there is a real question that racism is real. And so you need to examine your heart, right? You need to say, wait a minute, am I racist? It, and, and you should. I'm not talking about DEI. I'm not talking about intersection. I'm talking about you with the Lord, right? If, if you weren't raised around Latinos, right? Like I was raised around Latinos and blacks and everybody. I was raised in New York City. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, if, if you were not raised that way, well, how are you supposed to have friends that are Latino or black? You may not. Don't go, oh my God, I must hate them. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Please don't think that. They're not in my circle. Oh, I look in my circle and we're all a bunch of white guys. That's your circle. I, I don't fault that. Trust me, I do not. And I don't think that that should, as believers, we should look at that. But I think we should look at ourselves and say, hey, am I a racist? There was a brother who used to go to this church. And, and he said some really racist comments. And I had to say, bro, you're a racist. It's like, no, I'm not. What are you, a lefty? I'm like, whoa. No. What you just said was racist. Right? Here's what he said. He goes, is it my fault that white people choose to live in celebration? I'm like, that's a pretty racist comment. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody lives in celebration. There's a lot of different races here. You got the money? <laughs> right. It's, it's about the money. It's not about your color. <laughs> so... Uh, being called racist just because you're white is wrong. That has no basis. So me, I get the I, I'm, I get additional stuff. You guys just get called racist to white people in the room. I get I get really good. I got called the other day a Stockholm syndrome sufferer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sellout. You're light enough to pass. As I get told all the time, you're light enough to pass. That's why you don't have the problems I have. I'm like that's funny because every person, every Latino person in the world comes up to me speaking Spanish. So, yeah, I, what do you mean light enough to pass? It's a ridiculous comment. <laughs> we should seek to find common ground. Uh, in the book, The Gospel Comes with a Housekeeper, we got two minutes, guys, and I got four pages left. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So in the book, The Gospel Comes with a Housekeeper, the protagonist, the pastor, never compromises the truth when having dinner with Rosario Butterfield. He starts with love, concern, inviting her over to dinner. 
but in an effort to win her for Christ. He does not shy away from calling sin, sin, but he demonstrates God's love by opening his home. We may face persecution for standing for the truth. Right? May should be in quotes. Okay? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, other, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil and falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. This takes courage. This takes huge courage, and only through the Holy Spirit can we do that. Why we can't use chosen pronouns. Using transgender pronouns is a sin against the ninth commandment. You're bearing false witness against your neighbor. You are sinning. It encourages people to sin against the tenth commandment. You're coveting. Oh, you were born a boy. Oh, I want to be a girl. You're coveting. Wanting to be you. You're breaking a commandment. Using transgender pronouns is a sin against the creation ordinance. Reality number one, the creation. You are sinning against that. Using tra transgender pronoun discourages a believer's progressive sanctification and falsifies the gospel. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, the gospel and grace is not enough for me. I have to live the way I want to live. That's a lot of arrogance. And that's why we cannot support that. Uh, using transgender pronoun fails to love my neighbor as myself. We cannot claim winsomeness as a defense of utilizing chosen pronouns any more than we would agree with someone who says a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon is a Christian. So what does that mean? That means it's, it, it happens to me all the time where a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon will tell me they're a Christian and, and they follow Christ. And we, have to, we have to shut that down. And we have to shut it down lovingly. If you were here last night, I choose the Boniface uh, option, right? We're to be courageous. Uh, you're to enter that office. But if you're the guy sending the dirty jokes and you're gossiping at the water cooler and you're walking in five minutes late with the coffee, <laughs> there's a problem. If you're not the best worker, if you're, how can you stand for Christ? Right? That's like me giving a class on how to lift weights. It just doesn't make sense. We got to end there. You, you have to leave because there's another class. <laughs> you got to get to. No I, questions. I got three more pages. I mean, you, you have, you know, there's coffee people need to get. If you want to ask a question, I'll, I'll stand here, but I'm going to just. Are you guys in the notes out? How's that going to work? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, man, I didn't get it so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can send you all my uh, resources. I could send you this what I wrote. Uh, so you can yeah, give me your email address. Right in there. Huh? My email address? Okay. Ricardo, I think you have 10 minutes still. No, there's a, you're supposed to, that's your break time. Wow. Well, we don't I, listen, if you, you don't want to break, break. <laughs> if, you, if you want to ask me questions. Rivera, why not? This says <laughs> <laughs> I got Ricardo the racist. <laughs> Did you just learn? That's not, that's not. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Yeah, Comments? How did you um, approach? It's funny that you brought that up because I have a, a nurse who always comes to me for advice or whatever, and last week she identified herself as a Jehovah Witness. So, how would you lovingly approach her? She's never said, I'm a Christian, she just said, I'm a Jehovah Witness. But how would you lovingly approach that? There's an excellent site called CARM, C A R M dot O R G. I would go to that website. I would arm myself with apologetics for Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. to show through Scripture how what they're preaching is false, mm -hmm. and then I would hit them. So it takes preparation on your part. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I want to share something. I actually happened to me uh, uh, Thursday. I got in trouble. Actually, I got a written warning. So I was written down for this. Um, so it's November 2nd, and um, there's a team chat in my work, and um, supervisors and everything, and hundreds of people. And so they were doing this event, um, Dia de los Muertos, um, and uh, it's a Mexican pagan um, festival celebration. And so they, um, they had made an, a, 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 an external chat and for people to... I don't know, remember the dead or something, mm -hmm. and they were saying, well, if anybody wants to join our virtual altar, um, and 
I was like triggered immediately, and I wrote, altar? Who are we worshiping? <laughs> and, um, and then a few people were like, you know, a few people responded, and I just, I, I just, I really didn't think about it, and I just quoted James 4.4, 4, and I said, you adulterous people, don't you know that a friend of the world makes you an enemy of God? Mm. And I was like bombarded with DMs, and so asked, I was asked to take it down, and uh, I was written for it. Yeah. <laughs> so as an employer, right, yeah. um, I wrote up a guy once, and then I eventually terminated him for preaching on the job. Oh my God, Ricardo, you're a persecutor. He was stealing from me. I didn't hire you to be an apologist. I didn't hire you to preach to people. So I'd go to the guy and I'd warn him. I'd say, dude, you got to be working. You can't be praying like he'd stop and pray. All right, so you can't be sharing the gospel with my clients that you're going into their places to see. Your job is to work and produce. Oh, you're persecuting me. I'm like, I'm not persecuting you. You're stealing from me, bro. It's not what I hired you for. What do I say that for? I say that because there's... <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3, 1 3. There's a time and place for everything. That was a bold move. I respect your move. Good for you. I would have handled it differently, but I, I don't want to come against that move. But as the employer, they're responsible to make it a place that nobody is offended. That's pretty offensive. Yeah. The gospel is offensive. I don't disagree with your statement. And, and I, I said, listen, I was offended by you, by the use of the word altar. Mm -hmm. Because why would they put a word that implies worship? You can't yeah. use the word altar without yeah. implying some sort of worship. So, it's but a, I get it. It's a tough spot. It's a tough spot. But let me tell you something. When you stand for the Lord, and I'm not saying that I do it right and you do it wrong. What I'm, I'm going to give you an example. And, and this is for you too. So, so a coworker came to me and said, I got a problem. I says, what? He goes, you know, I go to church. I says, yeah. He goes, all three of my daughters, one's a lesbian, one thinks she's a boy, and one is living with a woman. All three daughters are my daughters going to hell. Oh, cool. <laughs> Here's an opportunity to speak to this guy seriously and say, what you have been believing in for a few years is flawed. And here's what you need to do. And yes, your daughters are going to go to hell if they continue and choose to live in this city. This guy completely changed his life. Him and his wife completely changed their life. It just so happens that two of the daughters are now, that's no longer a thing. One of them is living as a boy. But when you live for Christ, you have the opportunity to really speak into somebody's life. Not saying that a post on a forum is not a good thing, but I'm saying, are we really being affected? Is anyone reading that post and going, oh, praise God, hallelujah, I am now converted? I don't know. That's the question you've got to ask yourself. So, right? one of the things that I think, and not this one, but at some point it would be great, because I'm a case study type of person. Mm -hmm. I like to see things that have happened and how, how should we be responding. Because what happens is that, you know, each of us may have not experienced what you just experienced, but we all do experience certain things. And, and how many times... In the argument or in the conversation, do you have the exact right thing to say? It's not. It's when you walk away five minutes later, you're like, oh, wait, let me go back. And so that's what I want to be able to talk about, to prepare us for how to how to properly respond to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're right, and that only comes. Listen, my last, my last uh... also I want to add, I'm being influenced by the period. So I'm, I'm reading a lot of Puritan work, Puritan theology. Mm -hmm. So I, I really didn't think about it. I just, right, right. I snapped. I think you're in a cage thing, which is awesome. <laughs> I love this. Right? You found this, you found this truth, and you want to tell everybody. And that's awesome. I, 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 my last verse was Jude 23. Are you a fire snatcher? Is it, is it so in you to point others to Christ that you view yourself as grabbing them out of the fire... And hating even the flesh, the, the, the smell of the burning on them. Is that you? That's great if that's you. That's the way we should all be. Our desire should be to win everybody over to Christ. It should be burning in you. And if it's not, start praying. Get on your knees. Get into scripture. And see what our responsibility as believers are. 
We are to confront this world. We are. We are. We are. I choose the Boniface option if you were here last night. You are to confront this world, but it's going to be tough. You will be persecuted. You will be ridiculed. Welcome in. I, I, had, I had stories on here of my ridicule when I was on Wall Street. So we really got to close or I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.